This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We're going to be studying, once again, numbers in the Bible, specifically in the King James Bible, which is why I call it the King James Code. It is because the, the number meanings and the number patterns that are in the Bible can only be found in one Bible, and that is the King James Bible. And what number are we going to look at? I'll let you know in a little bit. First, let's lay the uh, biblical basis for what we do, which is counting things in the Bible. And I love the fact that so many of you have started counting things in the Bible. You've started looking at numbers, not just the number patterns in the Bible, but you're looking at the numbers themselves. Any story or um, any doctrine or anything like that that has a number attached to it, uh, like the number three, when we think of three, we automatically think of the Trinity, the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. That is a doctrine that has a number attached to it. There are other doctrines as well. We don't have time to get into all that today. But so many of you are looking at the numbers in the Bible. You're looking at the number patterns in the Bible. People are writing books. People are, are, are writing blog posts. They're doing YouTube videos on the things that they found. And I absolutely love it. Because it says that this is not just a Mike Hoggard thing. Even though, I mean, I don't know of anybody that was doing what I started doing all the way back in, I'm going to say 1998, 1999, when I first started seeing these patterns in the Bible. And the first one that I saw was the phrase, Word of God. And I found that in the Bible exactly 49 times. Now that's 7 times 7. When it occurred to me that the meaning of the number 7, perfection, completion, holiness, things like that. When I understood what the number seven meant, and then I linked it with the phrase word of God, which the Bible says is perfect, is holy, it is complete. It kind of startled me. And I said to myself, self, and myself said, huh? I said, self, Either this is just a, a, a one-time thing happening or there is more to it. So I'm going to use the, uh, the penny analogy that I've used before. Let's say you walk out of a store, walking down the sidewalk, you look down, there's a penny on the sidewalk. You bend over and pick it up and say, somebody lost a penny and I found it. So now you're rich, right? You put the penny in your pocket, you take 10 steps, you look down, there's another penny. You bend down, pick it up, put it in your pocket, and you think somebody's must be pulling stuff out of their pocket, and their pocket must be full of pennies, and every time they reach in their pocket and pull something out, a penny falls on the ground. You think it's still an accidental thing, and it's not anything to, to even ponder. You take 10 more steps. You look down, lo and behold, there's a penny there on the sidewalk, just like the previous two times. Now, by that third time, you no longer are thinking that this is some accident, that some guy is pulling something out of his pocket every 10 steps or so, and a penny happens to be coming out. You're thinking along the lines of, this seems to be more deliberate. Sort of like the turtle on the fence post. If you're driving down the road, and you see a turtle sitting on top of a fence post, there's something that you absolutely know 100% for sure is that the turtle didn't get up there by himself. It was deliberate. So number one, the, pen, the turtle didn't get up there by himself. Number two, the turtle can't do anything while he's up there. Number three, the turtle doesn't want to be up there. And you ask the question, I wonder who put the turtle on the fence post. Now you're asking the question, I wonder who's putting a penny 
on the sidewalk every 10 steps. So there's only one way to prove whether or not your idea is true that this is being done deliberately is to take 10 more steps. You take 10 more steps, there's a penny on the ground and you're going, okay, this is deliberate. And you start looking around to see if somebody's staring at you, laughing at you, if there's a camera on you, hitting, you know, candid camera, anything like that. You take 10 more steps, this is the fifth penny now. You reach over and pick it up, 10 more steps, a penny, 10 more steps. And you do this for a mile going down a big city sidewalk and you just notice that every 10 steps there's a penny. You can't just brush this aside as, boy, what a series of accidents I came into today. There's no way you can do that. You have to know that somebody deliberately put a penny on the ground, on the sidewalk, every 10 steps they intended you to find it. So now you start looking for meaning behind the pennies. And that's what I started doing and that's what a lot of you started doing. You started looking for meaning behind uh, these number patterns that you're finding in the Bible. And again, we're going to go into the scripture because the scripture absolutely tells us to search the scriptures and to count things in order to find wisdom. First place we go to, Revelation chapter 13, which is incidentally about the beast and the false prophet. And at the very last verse, we have uh, verse 18, Revelation 13, that the false prophet is going to cause everybody to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. And the Bible is going to give you wisdom concerning that mark. And it says, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. So the Bible verse itself has given you knowledge. The knowledge that you're getting from this Bible verse is giving you understanding. And in due season, this knowledge and understanding that we have of this number, six hundred, three score, and six, is going to give us wisdom. And that wisdom is going to tell us, do not receive that mark. Do not take on that number. Do not take the name of the beast. Nothing like that. All right? So, early on, when I was counting things in the Bible, and I was counting chapters, I went to the 555th chapter of the Bible, which is, let's see, what is it? It's, uh, it's Psalm 77. That's what it is. Then I went to the 666th chapter of the Bible. And what did I find? It's in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. So I was thinking, oh, I'm going to find the name of the beast there. Or I'm going to get some clue as to the meaning of the number. So 666 chapter. Ecclesiastes written by Solomon. Solomon is... Uh, imparting his wisdom. Remember, he had all the women that a man could want. He had all the cars, chariots. He had all the cars. He had music. He had, uh, he had live music every night if he wanted it. He had wine. He had women. He had power. He had money. I mean, it took him seven years to build God's house in Jerusalem. It took him 13 years to build his own house in Jerusalem. That sort of tells you where his mind was at the time. And so at the end of 40 years of having all of this, Solomon writes down his wisdom and he says, it was vanity. It's vexation. It meant nothing. It did not give me fulfillment in life. It was a joke. So he tells all of us men that all the things that we've lusted after all of our lives, things that we just wish we had, Solomon says, I had it. And it didn't give me the fulfillment that I was looking for. So he tells us in the 666th chapter, Ecclesiastes 7, in verse 25, I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. And then he says in verse 27 how he found it. Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one, 
to find out the account. So, two verses in the Bible. And, and the Bible uh, formula for believing a doctrine is that it should be from two witnesses or at the most three. So we have two witnesses, one of them Old Testament, one of them New Testament. They're both telling us that wisdom, knowledge, understanding comes from counting things, count the number of the beast, counting things one by one to find out the account. And, they're, and that wisdom comes from that, and they're both associated with the exact same number, 666. Now, those are pennies on the sidewalk. You can either A, just believe that this is an accident and it doesn't mean anything. And the, and the reason why you would think that is that deep down inside, you really don't believe that the King James Bible is perfect. You don't believe that God had his hand of blessing Inspiration, yes, I said inspiration. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. God never said that the inspiration of his scriptures would ever end. He never said that. God never said that the inspiration of this Bible would ever decay, corrupt, rot, fall into disrepair, become shambles, be a waste of time. God never said anything like that. He always said that his word was complete, that his word was perfect, that his word is inspired of God. That's present tense, by the way. Present tense. Anyway, so there's the basis now of our counting things in the Bible. And so what number is it that we're going to look at? We've looked at the number one. Uh, we've looked at the number two and all of its aspects and so on. We've looked at the number three, but I noticed we didn't finish it. There's something related to the number three that I think is highly significant. And I, I'll say this. Uh, it's very mysterious. It is a mysterious number. Some of you may have figured out what I'm talking about by now. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3 and let's look at something, something that I found years ago, just sort of kept it in the back of my mind, have kept it in my notes. But let's, let's find out what the Bible says about the number 33. Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. God didn't really say all that. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The only word that I have underlined in this whole phrase here is the word eyes. And if you count all the words that the devil spoke to Eve, in these five verses, the word eyes is the 33rd word. Wow. Now, let's think about this for a minute. How many eyes do we have? Well, we have one, two. I have four, three, four. Those who are in the newage movement, newage rhymes with sewage, those who are in the New Age movement, those who are into um, secret societies like Freemasonry, Odd Fellows, Rosicrucianism, those who uh, practice Satanism, those who practice uh, witchcraft, wizardry, any anything like that, uh, Hindu worship, 
the worship of, get this, the Hindu religion worships 330 million gods. That's 33 times 100 million. Okay? It's based on the number 33, and there's a reason why. We'll see that as we move along. Okay? But in those religions, the number 33 is a very, very important number. But getting back to the eyes, they say that we have this eye and this eye, but we have a third one. Right here, in our foreheads, directly back here somewhere, we have what's called the pineal gland. They have the two eyes, one here, one here. And then they have what they believe is a third eye, which is right here, in your forehead, right where the mark of the beast is going to go. They believe that's a sacred spot and it represents your third eye and that practically everybody that lives is third eye blind. Yes, there was a rock group named that. But you have to do certain initiation, certain rituals, uh, certain mind things and so on in order to get that third eye open. We'll see one of those here in just a little bit. So the fact that Satan referred to eyes, then your eyes shall be open. And that was the 33rd word that he spoke. It sort of tells me that he is implying not just these two eyes, because she could see perfectly everything that was around her, but he wanted this eye opened and activated. The thing that's back here is sort of like an eye. It's called the pineal gland. And the pineal gland ha has a function of detecting light. Your eyelids are very, very thin so that when you close your eyes at night and all the sun has gone down, this is in the days before electricity, the sun has gone down and with the sun going down and those, the tiny lamps that are lit in your house to, to light your house, they don't provide much light and all of a sudden you start getting sleepy. That's because the pineal gland detects light coming through your eyes. And if it stops receiving light, then it starts releasing uh, uh, in, uh, this thing that makes you go to sleep. I can't remember what it was. But then in the morning, when it's time to wake up, the sun comes up. And even though your eyes are closed, your eyelids are real thin and they're seeing light come through there. That light goes to the pineal gland. The pineal gland sees that it, the morning light has occurred and it stops releasing endorphins, what it is. It stops releasing endorphin and all of a sudden now we start waking up. So here's what's odd to me. The New Agers and all the Hindus and every, everybody like that, they say that, that when you activate the pineal gland, it awakens you. But the truth of it is, when the pineal gland is activated, put you to sleep. That means something for sure in the Bible. Anyway, moving right along. Here's an interesting uh, pattern that I found only in the King James Bible. Hence, that's why it's called the King James Code. Since we're dealing with eyes, the word sight, like the sight of your eyes, 333 times in the King James Bible. The 33rd occurrence of the word sight is in Exodus 33. And look at what it says. Now, therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight. He says it again. And consider that this nation is thy people. Oh, I love it. Moses wanting to find grace in God's sight. Reminds me of Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So 333 times the word sight. The 33rd occurrence is in Exodus 33. It just seems like, and I just searched this out just a few minutes ago. Because I was thinking, you know, 
Maybe the 33rd occurrence of the word sight would be found like in verse 33 or in chapter 33. Look, lo and behold, there it was. Then we have, remember, this third eye here. So take a look at these two graphics. On the right, you have the face of a human. And notice that it has two regular eyes. And then, just like I told you, the third eye. And it's illuminated, meaning it has sight. It's been opened. It's been activated. So the person now is asleep, which means they're awakened. And when they are, when the pineal gland is awakened, they go to sleep. I, you, you, I don't get it either. Then notice the, um, the illuminated triangle and do this. Draw a line, not, not really with a pen. I don't want you to draw this with a pen. Draw a line here and then two lines intersecting at your third eye. You have a triangle with your eyes, okay? That's one of the representations of the triangle at the top of the double-headed e eagle, which Manley Hall says is actually a phoenix, a phoenix that dives into the fire, is killed in the fire, rises up from the ashes of its own burning in the fire, which the fire always represents hell. Where's the beast coming from? He's coming from the pit. He's coming from hell itself. He's going to rise up from the flames. He is going to be given life again. That's what Revelation 13 tells us that he has a deadly wound, but then that deadly wound was healed. And where was the wound? Right in his forehead. Where was Goliath, the giant, where was he wounded? By David. Right in his forehead. Mm -mm -mm. Think about it, people. But let me briefly explain this to you. You have the double eagle, which means opposites. One's looking this way, one's looking this way. One's looking to the past, one's looking to the future, one is looking north, one's looking south, one's looking east, west, you get the opposites. One's pointed toward the night, one's pointed toward the day. One is male, one is female, but they're joined together in one body. And then, notice that under its wings, if you were to count these little starlets, there's exactly 32 of them. However, the eagle with the crown and the illuminated 33 makes 33. So think of this. These stars are always angels. Always. And what does Revelation 12 tell us? That the stars of heaven are going to fall to the earth. How many of them? One third of the angelic realm is kicked out of heaven and cast down into the earth. What is one third as a percentage? 33. Point 33, 33, 33, 33, 33. And it keeps on going and it never ends, does it? Now, think about that number, 33. It, will, it represents a third. And now we understand it represents the third of the angels cast out of heaven. Oh, I like this already. Now, I said that because we're going to go and understand the relation, or let's say um, the opposite part of this Antichrist that we've been talking about so far. He's the, he's the angel, the eagle, whose number is 33. That's one of the numbers associated with the beast is the number 33. I'll go ahead and tell you this. In the New Testament, the phrase, the beast. In fact, I'll let you look it up. Go to purebiblesearch.com, download the free software, install it, Linux, Mac, Windows. It'll work on all three. You have this free software for searching out the Bible. Type in the phrase, the beast, do a New Testament search only. 
and find out what number that is. Okay? You probably already guessed it. Now, who was it in the Bible that was 33 years of age? It's Christ. Now, there's no verse in the Bible that says, and Christ was 30 and 3 years old when he did this. But we count from the day that he was baptized by John. He was 30 years old. We know that for a fact. And by counting in the gospel record the number of Passovers that he uh, went through, there were three of them. So we know that Christ's ministry was three and a half years, meaning that Christ was 33, let's say, and a half years, okay? But 33 years. Only children, you know, when you say, how old are you, son? I'm six and a half. No adult says, yeah, I'm 42 and a half. Nobody does. Anyway, so notice this about Jesus who was 33 years old. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. Notice the Word is mentioned three times there. The same was in the beginning with God. All things, very important here, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Look at Ephesians 3, verse 9. All of them divisible by three. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ created everything. Keep that in mind. Colossians 1, 16. For by him... Jesus, I added that in there, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So, let's go to the chapter of the Bible that has the creation story in it. And in my Bible, that's Genesis chapter, of course, it's your Bible too, Genesis chapter 1. And take a look on the screen here. Now, there's a lot of reading here, and I'm not going to read all this. But basically, you have in the beginning, God, the noun, created. That's the verb. That's how English is, is done. The noun comes usually comes after the verb god created and then you look in verse 2 and the spirit of god moved you have god the noun moved as the verb then the verse 3 god the noun said the verb and you have that in just about every chapter or every verse of Genesis chapter 1. Now, there's only 31 verses in Genesis chapter 1. So let's go two, two verses into chapter 2, which would be Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. And notice that in verse 2, and on the seventh day, God, that's the noun, ended, that's the verb, this work which he had made. So, get this. In the entire story of God, Jesus Christ, creating the heaven and the earth, you have God, the, the noun, followed by a verb exactly 33 times in 33 verses. Ah, oh, I love it. Again, you won't find that in any other translation of the Bible except the King James Version. We have a numerical pattern here. Now, what I've just told you is a fact. You can take the fact and say, you know what, I think there's something to this. God, will you show me? You can do that. Or you can ignore it set it over to the side and say, this violates my belief system. My belief system is that the Bible is always what I say it's going to say. In other words, you don't believe that any Bible that we have out right now is perfectly preserved, perfectly translated 
for us living in these last days. You believe that you can go to the Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek and make just about anything you want in, uh, out of the Bible. You can make it say whatever you want. You can make yourself look important, look smart, like I used to do. I wanted people to think I was smarter than they were because I went to Bible college and I know more than they do because I can take a word and go to Strong's Concordance and look it up and come up with some obscure meaning that it never really meant that to begin with. But I could do that. And the people would go, wow, man, we're so blessed to have this man as our pastor because he is so smart. He tells us what the Bible really says. So that may your be your belief system. And your belief system will not allow for the Bible and its words to be unchangeable, unalterable, perfect. Your doctrine can't allow for that. So you just take this fact, you put it over to the side. But I'm not done with the facts. So we've looked at Genesis 3, the 33rd word that Satan said. We've looked at Genesis 1 and part of Genesis 2, the first 33 verses of the Bible, and found a significant pattern there that you have God the noun followed by a verb. God said, God created, God did this, God did that. 33 times in exactly 33 verses, and that's where the last noun that is spoken of God is God ended. Now think about Jesus. When he's 33, did he ever turn 34? No. No, he died at 33. God ended. In fact, God said from the cross, it is finished. God ended the work of the cross when he was 33 years old. Okay? So now, let's go to the 33rd chapter, Genesis 33, and look at what the Bible says there. Starting in verse 17, And Jacob journeyed to Succoth, and built him a house, and made booths for his cattle. Therefore the name of the place is called Succoth. Now stop right here. We have a, there's a, there's a, a Jewish feast day called Sukkoth. And Sukkoth means booths, little mini compartments. And he made booths there, and those booths are meant to be temporary. Because we see, we're going to see in this, in this passage here that when Jacob builds all this, he builds a place for him to, a house for him to live in, and then he moves. Look at verse 18. And Jacob came to Shalem. Stop right here. Do you know what that is? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Jacob left the place called Sukkoth, the temporary place. And he went to the place that is the permanent place. Are you getting this? It's like seeing us in scriptures. Right now, this is my temporary Sukkoth. My temporary tabernacle. It's not meant to last. One of these days, I'm going to leave this one. And I'm going to go to the permanent one in heavenly Shalem, Salem, Jerusalem, the city of peace. <clears throat> I love it. So follow me. And Jacob came to Shalem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padanaram and pitched his tent before the city. And he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. And he erected there an altar and called it El Elohi Israel. Oh, I love this. Number one, 
Right now in the city of Shalem, Salem, Jerusalem, you have the Jews, you have the Muslims, and you have the Orthodox Christians, like the Catholic Church, Eastern Orthodox, and they all claim that Jerusalem is their city. It's our city. No, it's our city because we're the Christians and we, we, uh, we come after the Jews and all you Muslims and it should be ours. And the Jews are going, oh, excuse me, we've had this city a long time. And who does it really belong to? Well, it belongs to Jacob because he bought a parcel of land, paid a hundred whatever pieces of money. He paid money for it. That means he owns it perpetually. When Jacob died, he handed it down to his children, who handed it down to their children, who handed it down on and on and on and on and on and on and on. So while all this time God may have let others dwell in there, the truth of it is, because of, by reason of the purchase that was made, the city of Shalem belongs to Israel. And the fact that when Jacob got there, he built an altar there. What do you think that altar represents in the 33rd chapter of the Bible? The altar at Jerusalem. What do you think that represents? Calvary, Golgotha, the cross the altar where the lamb was slain for the sins of all men. Ooh, somebody say amen. I'm liking this a lot. El Elohe Israel, I think it means God. El Elohe is the God of Israel. There is no other God for God's people. Amen. So in the 33rd chapter, we have him building tabernacles, booths, tabernacles, and the word tavern, believe it or not, ha are the same root word. And a tavern was not a place that you went to live permanently, unless you were the tavern keeper, the innkeeper. A tavern simply was a place that as you were traveling, it's sort of like Motel 6, as you're traveling, there is a there is an inn, there is a tavern, there is a lodge. You stop there for the night, they feed you supper, they give you a bed, they give you provender for your animals, and you spend the night because the nights are too dangerous to travel and you can't see and there's highwaymen there, bandits. And so the next morning you get up, grab all your stuff, you leave some money, and you keep going on your journey. The phrase tabernacle applied to this body. It's a dwelling place, but it's a temporary dwelling place for God because God doesn't intend to live in here for very long. One of these days, this tavern is going to be destroyed. This tabernacle is going to end and we are going to be the permanent dwelling place of Jesus. Oh, I like this stuff. So anyway, so if you go to, if you go to Brooklyn, New York, during Feast of Tabernacles, here's what you're going to see. Le according to Leviticus 23, And ye shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. Ye shall celebrate in the seventh month. Ye shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt I am the Lord your God. And seriously, these Orthodox Jews that, that dwell in this whole big neighborhood there in Brooklyn, they have, when they built these apartment buildings, they built them with the ability to add on to the sides of those, these booths. And depending on how serious the family is that lives there, some of them at the Feast of Tabernacles, will walk in there and they won't walk back out until the seven days are completed. Some of them spend all day there. Some of them spend all night there. Some of them have varying 
traditions of their own family. But that's what you're going to see there in their neighborhoods. So they're going to have the big furry hats, which are hugely expensive. And you're going to have these booths, which are pretty nice looking. I mean, it's not like they're sleeping on wood slats or anything like that. They're pretty comfortable. But that's what you find there to this day. They're still keeping this feast. And you know what it means? The idea of tabernacle, God dwelling with us temporarily in this booth that the Lord has made for us. Okay? But one of these days, it's going to be permanent. Okay? Also, in Genesis 33... The Bible says Jacob met Esau in this chapter. And they're no longer mad at each other. They're not at war with each other. They hug, they kiss, they cry on one another's neck. And here's what was said in verse 10. Jacob said to Esau, Nay, I pray thee, if now I, I have found grace in thy what sight, then receive my present at my hand. For therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of God and thou wast pleased with me. You know what that reminds me of? Now, again, we're in the 33rd chapter. No, uh, Jacob found grace in Esau's sight 333 times. And then he sees Esau and he says, it was like I had seen the face of God. Can you think of somebody else in the Bible that wanted to see the face of God? Moses. In what chapter did Moses ask God to see his face? It's in Exodus. It's Exodus 33. Look at what it says. And he said, Thou canst not see my face. This is God. For there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff to the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. So, I, I, like, I like the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament is full of mysteries, secrets. And they all pertain to Christ. You can see Christ in just about every chapter, every page of the Old Testament. But he's never identified as Christ. He's identified as a rock, as a high priest, as a lamb, as a lawgiver, as a prophet, as a judge, uh, I mean, you name it, as a rod. I mean, he's all kinds of things in the Old Testament. So, when Moses asks to see God's face and God says Moses I'm not ready to kill you yet so you can't see my face nobody can see my face and live however I'm going to show you something else that is me and it's going to reveal something to you I'm going to show you and I have that picture there up on the screen my back parts my spine now, what was God doing there? Your back parts, your spine, consists of, some of you already know this, 33 bones. You're in Exodus 33. And what God is showing Moses, instead of his face, he's showing him something else that represents Jesus Christ and it's his back his 33 bones of his back meaning 
Christ is represented by those 33 bones, his life lasting 33 years. God showing Moses his spine. You know, books, they have pages, they have covers, and they have one of these, the spine. And the spine is what holds everything else together. Now, my Bible has a spine. In fact, my Bible has two spines. And I want to clear something up, okay? There is, in social media, uh, a, a, a fallacy, an error floating around about what is the middle chapter of the Bible. Um, a lot of people are saying it's Psalm 118. But it's not Psalm 118. They're off by one. The middle chapter is Psalm 117. You see, there's 1189 chapters in the Bible without the Apocrypha. I'm going to count them. 1189 is an odd number, meaning that it's not divisible by two and gives you a whole number. When you divide 1189 by two, you get 594 and a half. So, let me do this. If you use the King James Pure Bible Search software, go to the 594th chapter. That would be Psalm 116. Psalm 117 would be the 595th chapter. Psalm 118 would be the 596th chapter. So, 594 and a half would be dividing the chapters right down the middle. Meaning that there are 594 chapters on this side, 594 chapters on the other side of Psalm 117, and then Psalm 117 would be the middle chapter between both sides. And Psalm 117 just happens to have only two verses in it. It's the shortest chapter in the whole Bible. Isn't that neat? That God rightly divided the Bible into two. 594 on one side, 594 on the other side, and that half a chapter on both of them in Psalm 117. So let's say that verse 1 belongs on this side, verse 2 belongs on this side. Then we would have it evenly divided as far as chapters is concerned. But here's where it gets interesting. I counted the words. You can do this too, purebiblesearch.com. I counted the words of Psalm 117, the middle chapter. There are exactly 33 words in this chapter. Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise Him, all ye people, for His merciful kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. Now again, not only do I not find any place in the Bible where God said the Bible would corrupt, where God said the Bible would eventually not be uh, inspired, where God said eventually the Bible is going to break down, we're going to lose words out of it, uh, some of the words won't be translated right. God, God never said that. In fact, God says the opposite here when he says the truth of the Lord endureth forever. And it does. The truth, didn't, didn't Jesus say to God in John 17, thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. Not some thought that God puts in our minds. I don't trust that. I only trust this, what I read right here. 
So, <clears throat> my, bi my body has a spine, 33 bones. My Bible has a spine here. And the chapters of my Bible have their own spine, which is Psalm 117, and it has exactly 33 words in it. Now, let me show you this. You've heard me talk about this before. Kundalini. Dun, dun, dun. And actually, this graphic here is, is from a film, a documentary film about Kundalini. And all of these people interviewed for this film, this documentary, they all explained the Kundalini process as like eye opening. Remember that third eye? Making them aware of things, making them see things more than they ever saw before. Giving them enlightenment, giving them understanding uh, of the world around them, of the universe, and, and all of the all of the false doctrines, all of the seducing spirits, uh, all of the, um, the hellish dogmas and doctrines that devils can dream up, that's what they've been illuminated to. Don't fall for this idea as like the thing you've been looking for. Let me tell you, the thing that you've been looking for is this. You just didn't know it. But now I want you to know it. That in all the searching that you've done, in all the religions, this is the one that you're going to find has all the truth in it. God's not going to lie. In, in fact, kundalini, when it happens upon a person who is not ready for it, all of the kundalini experts testified in this, in this documentary film that it's, it could actually be dangerous. It could throw you into a form of psychosis, meaning they would have to lock you up somewhere. And they would give you all these mind-altering drugs thinking that you had a, uh, some sort of chemical problem in your brain. But the truth of it is, you got hit by Kundalini and you were not ready for it and it, and it drove you crazy. Okay? That's the kind of stuff the devil does to his people. Anyway, what is Kundalini? Kundalini says that at the base of your spine, now remember, 33 bones, at the base of your spine is a serpent coiled up. And he lies there, he's dormant. And the bottom three bones of your spine. Now here's what's interesting. If you remember a while back, I taught about the spine and how it has these 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 nerve um, these nerves coming out of each side of it, one for the left side of the body, one for the right side of the body, and there how the brain signals this hand to wiggle its fingers and this hand to wave. Okay, kind of hard to do at the same time, but anyway, that's my brain doing this. So at the bottom three bones there are no nerves coming out of either side they're void I want you to understand that they are completely empty there's no life in them there's no remember the brain represents heaven it represents God the most high that's where God symbolically dwells here and God, the head, Christ is the head. He speaks to the body by way of these nerves that are coming out. Okay? But on the bottom three, there are no nerves. There's no instructions from the brain. Nothing but emptiness. Nothing but a void. It's the pit, people. It's hell. There's no light down there. There's no... Uh, electric waves down there. There's no information. There's no word going to and from the body in the bottom three bones. Isn't that something? So, when you practice kundalini, you want the serpent to be released out of its little prison. Think of the beast. He's in prison right now and he wants to be released. You want him to, to go back and forth in a crooked path 
up through the 33 bones of your spine, up through the seven chakras, which they described as energy vortexes. What that literally means is that they're devils, they're spirits, evil spirits, seven of them. Remember what Mary Magdalene had? She had seven devils and Jesus uh, uh, cast those devils out of her. Those seven devils are like the seven heads of the beast, which are seven kings. They're spiritual kings, not earthly kings, spiritual ones. And those spiritual kings are the opposite of the seven spirits of God. Follow me now? Isn't that neat? Whatever, whatever you have on God's side, the devil's side is just the opposite. You have Christ, you have Antichrist. You have the seven spirits of God. You have the seven chakras or the seven devils. Uh, the windswept house, where once he comes back, he brings seven more worse than him to fill this house up. Okay, now watch this. The whole point of the serpent rising up through the bones of your spine is so that he can activate, guess what? Your third eye, your pineal gland. He can activate it, which when it's activated, causes people to go to sleep. Instead of being awake, they're asleep. Mm -mm -mm. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to consider now Isaiah 14 and think of the path that the serpent has to climb in order to reach heaven. So he goes his way up and he wants to be like the most high. Let's read it now and then just kind of with your mind, just kind of picture the serpent rising up the 33 bones of your spine. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, the mind, the brain, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations, the ground, or let's say hell beneath. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I'm going to go back up to the head. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I, and there's seven words here, seven chakras, seven spirits, seven devils. You get it. I will be like the most high. Right here. The third eye, the pineal gland, having passed through the seven chakras, gone above everything else, he wants to be up here. And those who actually have a kundalini experience, that's what they say happens, is they can feel, they can feel this energy at the base of their spine, literally their their bottom, their bum, and they can feel it rising up like a, an energy, like an electric energy, back and forth, taking over their body, taking over uh, all of the activity that the brain sends down to the body and the body sends to the brain. And the serpent then strikes the pineal gland, poisons it, and that's what they say gives them illumination. Now they can see uh, colors of light that they could never see before. Now they can see spirits all around them, angels all around them where they couldn't see them before. Now they see light as a tangible thing and that this light is pure love. Oh, listen, they're taken in by this. These seducing spirits are doing just that. They're seducing these people into believing that they have reached nirvana. You know what nirvana means? It means to blow out like you would a candle. The Bible talks about every man having a, a light inside of him like a candle. And that God with some people 
blows out their candle, blows out their inner light, so they have no understanding whatsoever. Mm -mm -mm. If you remember from the research we did on UFOs, this is Dr. Stephen Greer's uh, CE5 group, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, and the cameraman actually captured an actual serpent of light spirit going into this person's bottom, the bottom part of their spine, going up through the 33 bones of their spine, landing right on their pineal gland, right where their third eye is. Folks, this stuff is real. It's not just what they believe and it's all fake and there's nothing to it. This is real. This is reality. This is what we're faced against in these last days. We're either fighting the people that have turned themselves over to these spirits or we're fighting the spirits that are in them and they are either working against us or they're trying to seduce us to join with them. And this idea of the beast, as it were, this serpent or this dragon, because we know that Lucifer is both a dragon, he's a serpent. This idea of the dragon going from the earth, climbing up into the heavens, it's actually seen now quite commonly not in the form of kundalini, but take a look at this. All 33 super heavy engines lit up. What is it referring to? It's referring to Elon Musk's new rocket system called the Raptor. Not the Rapture, the Raptor. You know what a Raptor is? You've probably seen, uh, you know, Jurassic Park. Raptor is a dragon. It's a reptile. It's a serpent. And so you have the, the Raptor engines, all 33 of them, rising up from the earth, ascending into heaven. Mm, 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 mm. Now, we're not done with this. It's a lot to go through here, and I want to take my time and really, really get you to understand it. This idea of the Kundalini and the 33 and the coiled serpent moving its way, it's not just in Hindu theology. The Jews, God's own people, the ones He loved, Jesus came in the form of a Jew. My Savior is a Jew. And I love it. I love the people of Israel. But they are so, so wrong right now. They have adopted into their religious practices and ideas this same idea of a coiled serpent moving its way up to activating the pineal gland. We'll see that when we get together next week. You're the reason why we do what we do. God bless you. Thank you very much for all your prayers, for your support. Continue to pray and support the people of Turkana as we continue to provide food for them so they don't starve to death. Pray for your country. Pray for this ministry. And I thank you already, those of you who keep us in your prayers today. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.